dead bodies will continue to be transformed into the flesh-eating ghouls. Hi, I'm Spooky Bill, and you're watching episode 8 of Pathophysiology of Living Dead. Today we're going to talk about lymphocyte activation and the role that the major histocompatibility complex plays, or the MHC. And it's going to bring everything we've talked about in the last few episodes together in a kind of harmonic convergence. <laughs> The MHC are genes that control the expression of an antigen on the surface of a cell. Now there's three types of these, but we're only going to cover two. Now, all nucleated cells of the body have a type a class 1 MHC, while most immune system cells, dendritic cells, uh, mononuclear phagocytes, and B cells have a class 2 MHC. Uh, in order to fully understand this, let's look back to the last episode. Let's look at the B cell. Now, if you remember, the B cell has all these uh, membrane-bound antibodies all over it. There's 10,000 of them on each cell. Now, each of these antibodies has a little variable portion here right at the tip. And the variable portions are all different, so there are approximately 10 billion combinations of B cells, right? So, in a, a virus that the world has never seen before, a, a bacteria, a foreign protein, right, an antigen of some, time, some kind that has never been seen in the world before, comes in contact with this B cell with these variable portions, right, it might not might not bond to it. It might not um, be enough to recognize it. So the next one's going to come along, and it might not recognize it, but eventually, right, the right B cell with the right variable portion of these antibodies is going to come along, and it's going to recognize uh, this antigen, and they're going to bind together. Now at this point, the, uh, the B cell takes in the antigen, breaks it up, and presents a portion of it on the MHC, right? This is the MHC two, class 2 uh, molecule. It pushes it to the surface of the cell, right? So there's our little portion of the antigen on the surface of this B cell. Now, in some cases, this might be enough to activate the B cell, but the B cell has a sort of fail-safe. On my mark, rotate, launch key to set. Three, two, one. Mark T minus 50. In most cases, it will require the help of a T cell, a helper T cell to be more precise, in order to activate. But how does a T cell activate? Well, if you remember, uh, back in episode 4, maybe, we talked about phagocytes and phagocytosis. And one of my favorite type of phagocytes is a dendritic cell, right? It has these long dendrites, these long arms that can reach out, right, and grab the pathogen, right? It, at this point, it, it grabs it, recognizes the pathogen, recognizes it as an invader, it draws it in, and it, what it's going to do is it's going to break up, this is inside the cell, right? It's going to break up this uh, pathogen into all these little pieces here, right? And what it's going to do is going to take a little chunk of that piece, a little chunk of that antigen, and the uh, MHC, I don't know, say the uh, MHC inside the cell, the MHC uh, class 2 molecule is going to attach to this piece of the antigen, at which point it's going to push it forward and it's going to present on the surface of a cell. There we go. So we have our dendritic cell, our MHC2 molecule, which is bound to a chunk of the antigen. Now at this point, we're ready for the helper T cell to come along. All right? The helper T cell says, oh, hey, look at this. You have something funny on you. And the dendritic cell says, yeah, maybe you ought to do something about it. So, now just like the B cell, um, helper uh, T cells, they have a receptor called a T cell receptor. We'll say it's this uh, little, the little end of the balloon right here. Right? So that's a T cell receptor. And just like B cells, um, they have a variable portion. So, this specific antibody, uh, antigen is coded for this specific 
variable portion of the T-cell receptor. So the T-cell receptor, part of it's going to bind to the antigen, part of it's going to bind to the MHC2 receptor. Now if you remember, helper T-cells are called CD4 as well because they have this this little receptor called a CD4 receptor. And um, while the while the T-cell receptor binds to the antigen and the MHC2 receptor, the CD4 receptor is also going to bind to the uh, MHC2 uh, MHC2 molecule just at a different point. All right. So at that point, the T cells are activated. Now, cytotoxic T cells work in the same way, except they their their CD8 receptor recognizes a uh, uh, class one MHC. So now the T cell has been activated, right? What does it do? Well, it makes copies of itself with the help of interleukin-2. We won't go into anyway, but it makes copies of itself. And these copies differentiate into two types, right? Memory T cells, which are copies of the, the original T cell with that same T cell receptor. So if it comes in contact with that same antigen in the future, right, because these are long-lived. If it comes in contact with this, that antigen in the future, it can deal with it quicker and with, uh, with more efficiency. So if you remember, the, the body stops producing T cells at around puberty, so all the T cells that it's, it's producing, it needs. It, it needs to make copies of itself in order to keep the T cell count high. But effector helper T cells, now this is where the magic happens. Remember, these are your tongue criers. Huh? x tree, x tree, read all about it. Pearl Harbor bombed. Roosevelt declares war. Well, that's they tell your body to amp up production and proliferation of B cells and cytotoxic T cells. Now there's an army of these effector helper T cells. And when those T cells find that V cell that was activated, right, or that was, that is presenting that specific antigen on its MHC2 receptor, right, again, they're going to bind and it's going to activate the B cell. Now, at this point, B cell's activated. What happens? Well, the B cell then, it creates, just like the, uh, um, just like the T cell, it creates memory B cells, right, which are exact copies of the B cell, that same variable portion, and these can live for years inside the uh, lymphoid follicles, and hence you have immunity. But also creates the effector cells, which are called plasma cells. Now these are super cool, right, because they produce and spit out at 2,000 per second, no less, antibodies with that same variable portion coded for that same antigen that activated the B cell, except these are free floating, right? It spits these out 2,000 per second, and they, see, they travel around, and eventually they're going to find the, um, the right pathogen, the, pa the antigen that they're coded for, right? Now, at this point here, what happens is it's now tagged this antigen for uh, a, a macrophage or something to come along and eat it, right? Remember, this is called opsonization. To prepare for eating. See? It all comes together. Now, obviously, there's more intricacies than I've outlined here, but there's a couple reasons I wanted to go over the MHC. The first being its polymorphism, or diversity. Now, the MHC is one of the most diverse group of genes in the human body. Now, why is this? Well, it's adaptive in evolution, and it assures that at least some of the population will survive an epidemic, like, oh, I don't know, the zombie plague. But the second, well, I stumbled across something really interesting while I was researching uh, the MHC. And I feel like I have a clear reason as to why some types of zombies, both zombie vita and zombie mortis, why they can seem to, to smell us out. How did they know where we were? They can smell us. They want to feed off us. 
Originally, I theorized that this was because of their production of Future Scene and Cadaverine, but that really only explains how they can recognize one another, not us. Now, I want to bring your attention to some research and theories that have been done in evolutionary biology, and I'll throw references in the show notes for you. But since the MHC is such a diverse group of genes, and the more diverse the group of genes of MHC, the stronger the immune system is. And it's been suggested that we have evolved systems of recognizing MHC through olfaction, right? People with different MHC than our own in order to mate with and create offspring with a better immunity. 1976, experiments were done with mice that showed that male mice have a preference for female mice with dissimilar MHCs to their own, and similar results were found in fish. 1995, Klaus Wedkind showed similar results, right, that, that MHC dissimilar mate selection through olfaction. What he did is he got a group of male college students, had them wear t-shirts for two nights without cologne, without deodorant, or scented soaps, right, then he took those shirts and he had a group of female college students smell them. Yeah, I know it sounds gross, but the results were overwhelming that the women preferred the scents of males who had different MHCs to their own. In 2005, it was shown that women were more indecisive towards men with similar MHCs to their own. The sense of smell, we'll discuss the senses more in a future episode, the sense of smell is one of our most primitive senses and it's connected almost directly to the brain. And as you know, the brain is key to killing many types of zombies, but it's highly dependent on respiration. However, respiration is not necessary entirely for particles to travel up the nose. So here's what I'm getting at. Since the MHC is responsible for presenting chunks of an antigen on the surface of cells from both infected cells and immune cells, and it appears that humans have developed a system of recognizing MHC in potential mates, I don't think it's a far reach to theorize that zombies can detect MHC in other humans uh, from both infected and uninfected and maybe even immune and if they're immune maybe those are the ones they completely devour instead of biting and infecting so that's my theory I really want to know what you guys think I really want some feedback on this and uh, I, I want to start some dialogue I want to start some discussion on this so what I'm gonna do if you remember from the POTLD minus P minus pathophysiology I announced that I would have a contest right is telling zombie movie giveaway. So this is where it's going to come into play. I want you to find this episode on thefearinside.com and I want you to comment on it. Then I want you to send me an email to zomsai at gmail.com and tell me that you put in a a, uh, a comment and you want entered in the contest, right? And also put down your shirt size. So that way there's less chance of fraud and if you win I can contact you directly. So that's it for Pathophysiology of Living Dead. Thank you for watching, and remember, stay spooky. Visit pennycult.com and thefearinside.com. Okay. Virus.